Okay, so this is a little bit unusual for me today. I can't see my notes because for some reason I'm not able to see the presenter view. So I'm going to be a little more ad libby than normal, but I think that'll be fine. <laughs> so here we go. We're going to talk today about 11 steps to turn your freelance projects into sustainable businesses. How many of you have freelance projects that you do? How many of you have already taken those and brought them into businesses? Okay, so a number of you have um, already gotten past the point of just taking little pieces um, from clients or friends, maybe, and turning that into client work. So I'm gonna share with you my process and my story, and you're gonna get to know me a little better, but I'm also gonna ask you a little bit about your process and your story because we can all learn from one another in this community. That's the beauty of WordPress and, and the beauty of the community that we've formed around WordPress. When I was 22 years old, I was invited to take part in an executive career workshop. It, there were lots of other people in there and the goal of the group was to, to determine which of us were suited best for corporate life and which of us were suited best for something else, like an entrepreneurial journey. And uh, they wanted to know who was a better fit so they could know where to guide these people who were in the course with me. And through a series of assessments, we were each scored and after tallying up the results, we had to, um, uh, we were given these assessments and we were given things to ask ourselves, um, questions that we would ask ourselves. And then we had to determine what our top qualities were and what that meant for us and our future. And let's see. Um, my three top scores helped me to determine that I was an entrepreneur at heart. And so that's my first step, is you have to determine, are you cut out to be an entrepreneur? Do you really want this life? Because it's not easy. <laughs> um, there are lots of ups and downs, and I like to think that most of the ups are highlights. I, I love, love them. I even love the down periods because they're challenging times that help me to grow. But it's something that you have to make sure that you feel comfortable with. If you want a steady income, all the time and you know that you need that in your life maybe you just want to do the freelance which is a little add-on to your regular income maybe trying to grow your own business isn't the perfect route for you so that's something that everybody has to decide for themselves right now how many of you already feel that you're an entrepreneur at heart okay how many of you wonder Okay, great. So we're gonna go and look at my answers. Uh, remember I was young, but this is my actual handwriting from when I was 22 years old, isn't that fun? I found the book that, um, that they <laughs> gave me and, and was reading through it. And so my top three were that I have a high energy level. You can't tell that right now because we're on day three of WordCamp Los Angeles and I've been running around a little bit because I'm one of the orgs, so. Um, but. Typically, that's me. Um, uh, people trust me. Seems like a weird thing for me to say about myself, but throughout my life, it's been something that has been a constant. And so that's, that was one of the entrepreneurial traits that they had listed. I also have a strong desire to achieve. When I set a goal for something, I want it to happen. I can't walk away. And even if it gets really, really tough, I pursue it instead of abandoning the project. Not everybody's like that. Some people have this blissful ability to be able to say, you know what, it's just not my skill set, and walk away. It's really hard for me to do that. And so knowing that about myself has helped me, not only in my business journal journey, but throughout my life. So, um, let's see. I hired a business coach uh, when I decided that I was gonna grow my business. And in my first interview with him, he said, what do you think your best assets are? 
And I told him that my greatest asset was that people trust me. And he said, that's a really weird thing to say. <laughs> and I said, it's true. If I go to the grocery store and I accidentally you know, take the wrong change and I take it back or I walk out of Staples with a cart full of stuff and then realize it and take it back in, I don't ever get in trouble, okay? Because people trust that, yes, I just made a mistake and they're gonna help me through it. If, um, if I ask somebody to do it and I tell them that they have the capacity to do it, people rise to the occasion and they're able to do it. Um, if I tell a client that we can guarantee you this result, the client believes me and we're able to work together to achieve that result. My business uh, is, and I don't know, that introduction was kind of long, so you may not have actually heard all the depth to it, but it starts with content. Um, I have a business that helps people to get their blogging done. If they own a business and they don't have time for their website content, they come to me and my company and we help them produce it. We do website content, we do email campaigns, we do, we even do some website builds for existing clients. We do a bunch of different content related um, products. And you have to trust somebody to give them your voice. Do any of you have clients in that similar field where you're either writing for them or posting for them on social media or um, representing them at conferences where, where you have to really go out on a limb and be your client? Saw a few hands raised. So when that happens, that requires a great deal of trust. But your qualities may be different. Maybe instead of listing these three, you would list something like, I enjoy working more than 50 hours a week. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> um, or I come from a family of entrepreneurs. That actually sets you up to be an entrepreneur yourself if you have that model to base your life around. Or I'm quick to make decisions. What are some other things that you feel would help you to be an entrepreneur? Anybody have any they want to suggest? Uh, outreaching potential clients. The ability to outreach potential clients. Now, do you mean you have a big base that you can draw upon, or do you mean that you feel comfortable meeting on a cold call? <laughs> Me, personally, I wouldn't know where to start to effectively spend my time on it. Okay. So you wouldn't know where to start, so that's something that maybe you might need. Like I hired a coach to help me set some of my goals and push myself, and for accountability and productivity. Maybe you need a coach to help you just in that one area, and a coach doesn't have to be someone you pay for. I mean, in my case it was, and now we're great friends. Um, but sometimes you can form an accountability partner with the people in your local WordPress community, in your local community, your neighbors, your brother, your sister, you know, your parents. All of these people and your friends can work with you to help you become the entrepreneur you want to be and you can learn from them the skills that you feel you're currently lacking. Anyone else have a skill that they think they need to have to be an entrepreneur? Yes? Willingness to, to risk failure, absolutely, right? Um, and willingness to risk failure, not just on your own behalf, but on behalf of your clients, and be able to step in and make it right again, okay? It's a big thing. Are, are you willing to open yourself up to that possibility? I think there's a quote, um, Thomas Edison, Oh, I don't even remember it right on the spot, but you know, you have to fail over and over again in order to succeed is basically the, the gist of it. You can look it up later. <laughs> um, but failure is a part of running a business. You, you're not gonna be 100% all of the time. Okay, someone else had their hand raised, yes? I, I feel that you said a skill, right? That makes you an entrepreneur? That makes you a better entrepreneur or that, will, that helps you to be one? 
Okay, the ability to constantly communicate with your client, to have that customer service, and, and to know that it's required. Not everybody gets that, okay? But if you internally know what level of service and you have integrity towards that, you're gonna deliver a product that is gonna surpass your competitor. Anyone else have any other things that they wanted to add? I don't think, excuse me, I don't think this is so much a skill, but it is a skill that should be developed, but I think it's a matter of will to express yourself. Because you have to be out there and you know whether it's writing or you know doing YouTube videos or something like that, and that is frightening, I think, to most people. Because of what other people have said is like fear, fear of failure and that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay, so he said the will to put yourself out there. Because when you own your own business you don't, you don't always get to sit on your couch with your laptop typing your stories, you guys. You have to get into the real world. You have to go to chamber meetings. You have to go to civic events. You have to go to conferences like this and get to know other people because how else are you gonna be able to spread the word about your product? And you have to have these real life events so that you are able to produce real life results for your clients. Okay, they also had us write a paragraph. I want you all, as you're reading through my things, to kind of think about what would you write? And maybe after the session's over, take a few minutes and uh, put together your own paragraph on why would self-employment be a good fit for you? Obviously, I was put in the self-employment group, okay? Um, <laughs> so I wrote, self-employment would allow me an opportunity for growth. It would allow me to share my talents and knowledge with others, helping me to benefit their lives at a higher purpose, right? <laughs> I have an innate need to help others solve problems and share what I have. Those were all um, things that were on that list. And those are all necessary for self-employment. I also like to make decisions and act upon them, which would make self-employment a good career choice for me. So those strengths, are things that I've had to work on. Are there strengths in your lives that you have had to grow from being an entrepreneur or taking your first freelance project? Do you remember what it was like to do that first one? Does anybody have anything they want to contribute on that? Okay, I'm gonna go on then. Um, but being able to be an entrepreneur is something that, um, if you're considering it as an option, you need to have this why. You need to have something to go back to. Simon Sinek wrote Start With Why. I'm sure all of you are aware of that, um, that book and his talks. He had a TED Talk. Great place to start if you don't know what your why is. But what I found is that as I've progressed through my life, I go back to this over and over again, and it, it really is a part of me and my continual mission, no matter what my business is. And, it's, and so it, when you understand what your why is, it motivates you to move further and faster um, to grow that business. Because it's a gift. It's a gift I gave myself instead of working for someone else full time. And the pros to entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurship are straightforward, it may seem. I mean, you get to call the shots, right? Is that why everyone wants that's why you want your own business, is so you can be boss. Okay, raise your hand if you agree. <laughs> okay, well, strategy, it's all yours. You get to figure it all out. Success, it's also all yours until you start to build a team. Responsibility is all yours. And inspiration all comes from you. When you wanna take time off, you can take off as much time as you want, but it does affect your bottom line. And so you need to understand that work-life balance. And for me, work-life balance has always been that my life is very balanced if there's no work coming in. But when work piles in, how much sleep do you think I get? Right? There, and so work-life balance isn't as easy to achieve as we expect. Um, and it's not necessarily something that you can do just by blocking out hours. 
you can try. You can set different hours for the times where you're going to accept phone calls. You can set hours for when you're going to answer emails. You can set hours for when you're going to meet with clients. And then you can set hours for when you're going to do your actual work. Because those other three things are not really accomplishing the tasks at hand. As you grow into a business, this becomes very important because you need to move from uh, just doing it all yourself to hiring a team. And so establishing office hours gives your team a chance to know when they're supposed to work. Uh, having set hours of email allows your team to fill in those hours for you. You start to build people who can start to replace you in small areas. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Because you need to determine the difference between working hours and billable time. So we all know we have so many hours in the day, right? If we have a business and we think we're spending all of our time on our business and we are growing our business and it is doing so well, but we're really only spending four hours of billable time each week, is that gonna pay the bills? No, you need to set goals for yourself on this because every hour that's billable time is going to equate to a dollar. And Bridget Willard, sitting in the front row here, is gonna be talking about job costing and she will give more um, depth on how you can increase your, your hourly rate so that that billable time matters more uh, and, and helps you to accomplish the goals. Um, this was my main reason for hiring a business coach was that I have eight kids. I'm a busy mom, or was when I first started my business and I needed to be able to carve out my work hours, but not just the hours that I would work, the hours that I would work on client work, the hours that I would work on calling people back and taking care of that customer service. And then when I got to the point where I was able to hire someone to fill in some of that time, it was amazing. My business started to grow because I was no longer trying to manage it all myself. And so a lot of times, uh, once you have your working hours defined and your billable time defined, it frees you up to be able to see, I don't have to do all of this myself, and maybe I can be billing for somebody else's time as well. So it's the next step. Then after that, you need to, and really this is kind of hand in hand, but um, once you realize that you're, you have a, a billable rate that you can charge, you need to just assess it and make sure that it's covering your monetary needs and set appropriate goals. Um, what I've always been taught is to follow the rule of three. One third goes back into the business. One third is income, gross profit though. And one, uh, or, or gross income, and one third um, goes to overhead or your, you know, running your company. And so as you are um, dividing up those percentages, you need to understand how to do the multipliers. If you're gonna hire other people, so that's gonna cut into that one third, how much do you really need to be making as a business? And my actual numbers, I can't see right now to, to show you, but um, if you were, I, after, taking out your vacation time, because those can't count for, if there's 290 hours in a year, you have to take out 140 if you want a two week vacation. And if you have um, a f holiday time, that's another 100 hours that you're taking out. And, and you keep reducing by whatever it is that you want to make sure is top priority in your life then you end up with, I think it was 1904 hours. Um, if you're working a 10 hour week, five days a week. And those hours need to be then divided 
um, or multiplied by your hourly rate so that you can determine your income. And when you do all of that and you take that roll of three into consideration with it, you suddenly realize you need, your company needs to make a lot more than you expected. So my business, this is how I grew everything, was we went from five clients my first year. I determined that with five clients that was enough to cover what I needed to um, do financially. And uh, using that rule of three, once I had five clients, then I wanted to expand so I could hire more team members and, um, and build out my business. And so I went from five to 35 in that first year, super fast growth. And then the next year, by the end of the year, we had more than 100 clients. Because you'll find that at that first jump, it's very difficult. Getting from five to 35, it was a lot of work. But once I got there, suddenly referrals and word of mouth and exposure, just me being places, uh, started to bring in more clients in a very natural way and referral relationships. So you can experience expansion, exponential growth even if you're the one who's doing most of the work as you try to expand. One of the ways that I was able to have this growth is because I created a baseline product or service. So I had um, my blogging, we had a package that people could purchase. You could call that a product, you could call it a service, it really is both, because it was something that um, they would sign up for once and then it would start and it was recurring. And having that recurring income helps you to have that base so that you can grow the business from there. So once we had people uh, on as recurring income for a few months, it started to become more of a settled income. It didn't feel like I was looking for a new client every week. And the more of those that came in, the more solid my company became. We started offering other products and services. I, I mentioned sometimes we do website development. And so we, start, we built that out. We built out the steps. We're gonna talk about that. But by choosing your services, you're gonna be able to have something where you can build your um, sales pitch, your process, everything around so that it can be replicated and shared and other people can share what you do with other people. How many of you have your product and service in mind already? Okay, how many of you are web designers? Okay, so you build websites. Bloggers, anyone do writing for someone? Okay. Anyone do social media posting? Okay, so some of you do a little bit of both. You combine the efforts. What other services do you offer that I didn't list? Development, even more development like plugin development or, okay, great. Web hosting. Web hosting, okay. So managed, uh, like a managed hosting business is a very solid business. Is Josh in here? No, okay. Anyone um, else have something they want to shout out? Do a little bit of accessibility. Accessibility, okay. Right now, accessibility testing and audits, it's a good business to be in. So by, but you can't just say I do accessibility and not do the work behind it. You have to find out what's it mean to offer that as a service and do your research put together your individual offering. How are you gonna differentiate from whatever competitors are out there and then be the go-to person for that service? So step five is develop a step-by-step -step system for your product and service. You'll see there's post-it notes here. How many people use post-it notes? Okay, <laughs> whiteboards. <laughs> okay, there are so many different tools. Some people use everything online and they do all their planning online. I'm not that person. <laughs> I do some online, but a lot of times I've got my post-it notes out, I've got little strips of paper here, notepads that say I'm awesome, you know, <laughs> different things, just to kind of motivate me because I find that color helps me to outline steps better. 
And so when we wanted, when I wanted to offer a blogging service, I had to write out what does that mean? It means a client intake call. It means creating a document that has all the client information in it. It means reading and researching either the industry, well, not either, but the industry of that client and their style of writing so that we can write in their voice. Um, and then it means creating those first posts, learning the back end of their website because we upload all of our posts to it, and uh, sending the initial drafts to the client for review, talking to the client, getting the acceptance. So there are all these steps that had to be kind of systematized so that it didn't, it wasn't me doing them every time. With my first five clients, I was the one doing them all the time. But beyond that, I needed help. And I recognized that and brought other people in. But because I had put together a step-by-step -step system, someone else was able to see the process and help with it. Step six is write and create videos outlining each of those steps. So I use Screencast, um, I think that's what it's called, uh, to, uh, it's just an extension in my browser and they changed the name not too recently. I used to use um, something called Jing, but it doesn't. Oh, uh, it's gone. Uh, it doesn't always work as well for me. I, I think it's still there, but I think my videos are too long for it. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, when we started building some websites on a template-based solution, and that required a lot of little steps, so we put that in our project management tool and made templates so that people could see the written steps. But I also made videos for each step so that if they didn't understand what the technical details were, they could watch the video and then go and do the step. And that has been huge in building my business because when you make a video, you're not just training one person, you can share that multiple times as you have new hires. And um, hiring people has been somewhat of a challenge to me as a business owner. Uh, I've, I have, I love my team and we, we do great, but every once in a while we bring someone in and think it's going well and then it's just not a good fit for whatever reason. And so by having the videos, it means that it wasn't my time invested in the training. And from this, I ended up doing a training course for our internal team, and then I was able to use that course, actually, to give to my clients for a do-it-yourself course. So it, it's been a huge benefit to create those videos and write out those outlines. Have any of you had uh, the opportunity to do that yet? Tell me about it. So uh, I'll do something similar to what you do, is I'll screen capture my, my desktop have myself talking in a small corner window and just work through uh, the process. Right. And do you keep it to one step at a time or do you go maybe three or four steps? It's, it's mostly conversational. So like at the beginning of the video, I'll mention what the, uh, the goal is and then go for like five minutes and then uh, complete it. Okay. Keeping it really short. Great. And one of the benefits of that that I haven't mentioned is if you have a remote workforce, like I have, uh, um, I'm based in Orange County, but one of my riders is in Los Angeles. So because of traffic, we don't get together very often. But I can send her a video, she can watch it, and she feels connected to me. Just like, you know, they're always telling when you're promoting your business to get on YouTube or um, do your nine second video. It's because when people see your face and hear your voice, they feel a part of what you're doing. And so it's, it actually serves to do some team building as well. It's way better than just you know, sending emails to people over and over again and lists. And be willing to learn. If once you start bringing people into your team, you may find that other people know more than you about a specific thing and can teach you. So I taught them and they taught me. Then 
you need to make sure that you've defined your expectations because as that team grows, there are expectations set on all levels. The product, you want to make sure you're maintaining your quality because the farther that you get away from it, the easier it is for the product to diminish or, or take on a life of its own, right? Absorb pieces from your team members. Um, the client, you want to make sure that you are keeping in contact with that client as they expect and at the rate that you have planned for. If you end up on a four hour call with a client when you planned for a half hour, one, it's ruined your day, but how are you gonna build for that? You've gotta think those things through so that you can define those expectations at the beginning. When I write up a contract for a client, if there are phone calls included in it now, those phone calls are bullet pointed out as to when they will occur and how long they will be. Your staff, You've gotta have expectations for your staff. It's not just a matter of saying this is the task that needs to be performed. It's how are they going to reflect your company in doing that task? Are they excited about doing the work? If they're not, why not? Let's find out because what we're doing is fun, at least at my company. Hope at yours too. Um, and so that's something that's really important is to make sure that some, somebody isn't getting a mixed message um, as they're learning their job because then they're not going to deliver what you expect your clients to see. With your vendors, you've got to be very clear on payment and um, uh, how, when you expect the job to be done and what quality of work you expect and what tools they're going to use. Not that you're dictating it for them, but so that you understand where they're coming from so your expectations are not set differently than what they're expecting to give you. And you have to set expectations for yourself. Sometimes you have to take a break and that's okay, but you need to kind of define what you're gonna, what you're gonna do during that time. Um, there have been times where I just get burnout on writing because at least in the early days of my business, I wrote every day for hours on end, loved it. I soon realized that I was not running out of words per se, but I wasn't excited about it anymore. And by setting expectations for myself and limiting myself to two hours of writing a day, I was able to rejuvenate myself and have more fun getting back into my client voice um, and, and creating my own projects. So sometimes I think when we start a business and we're trying to grow it from freelance work, we try to do too much and we let our expectations for ourselves for having a life and <laughs> um, doing the things that we love that starts to get buried under all the work that has to be done. So it's really important to, to make sure that you're being true to yourself and um, keeping to your own expectations. Step eight is strategize a plan for attracting clients. Where are you gonna find them? Okay, you can come to conferences if that makes sense for your demographic for bringing in those clients. You can go to, I mentioned chamber meetings. That has been a successful thing for me and other people that I know um, because you make friends in those places. And as you make friends, you find out about their businesses naturally versus just calling out of some list. And people like to work with people they like to work with. What are some ideas that you've had for attracting clients? Where are some places that you've gone? Just networking events in the city that you're servicing, for example, like, or for the location that you're servicing. So if there is a, you know, some sort of fundraiser, because I find that clients that I've met, my team, my brother and I work together, I've met, it's just being out and about having a cocktail, then that turned into a client. Okay, so networking events have turned into a client because it's not a high pressure situation. Right. And also, especially at fundraisers, if people are spending money to donate to the school 
the rescue society, the, you know, cancer group, whatever it is that they're donating to, likelihood is that they're turning a profit. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be there. So be at places where people are already spending money. Any other suggestions? Referrals. Referrals. So I get all of my clients except for one from work camps. Okay. Referral business. Because I'm either working for the actual person like this person, or he's telling me about a client. Okay, so what Bridget said was that um, she meets people at WordCamps. Very specific to, she's doing marketing, and so it's very specific to her. There are lots of development companies and plugging companies and other individuals who need marketing services at WordCamps. So it's a great place for her to show up because they don't realize they need it until they see what she can do, which they see it there, you know, from someone else who's attending, and that's how she gets her referral business. Also, our website developers like to have words on their websites. Yes, and we're website developers like to have words on their websites, yes. And that's actually one of the reasons why um, I'm able to find clients at these events too, is because people need people to write the content in order to launch that website, right? Like that's a huge thing for clients. Anyone else, another venue? Yes. Absolutely, volunteer your services, whether it's a TEDx event, so it's, you know, something where business people attend, or even just volunteering at your school and telling people, open your mouth, tell people what it is that you do. All of this in-person contact is something that we lack a lot of, you know, everybody's on their devices nowadays, and so sometimes it's easy to forget that stepping out of your door and actually attending an event is a great way to meet people who will become your future clients. Another thing you can do is um, I do work for nonprofits, and so I attend some of their community events. So it's not my group of people necessarily that I'm. Um, meeting when I go to those events, I meet people outside my sphere. And that's a great way to um, get, let other people know about your services so that you can start to expand that circle. Another thing is, how many of you do email lists and um, send out regular updates to clients? Okay, not all of you have clients, I get that. But, <laughs> Um, that's a great way if you have them, if they've signed up on your list and it's all authorized, we don't want any GDPR issues going on here, but we, um, as you're communicating with them, they sometimes forward those emails. I know that I, I use a product called Infusionsoft in, in my business um, for sending out emails and it has a great return for getting into people's inboxes. And we've had times where, like, we've had to slow everything else down for a month because we sent out one email and got so much response. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's a normal thing for people, but we don't send them on a regular basis. And because of that, when we do, our clients take notice. So there's two schools of thought as to how frequently you want to be sending out um, your newsletter or giving a client update. The, um, of course, social media is another way. If you don't have a Facebook page or a LinkedIn page for your company or um, if you're not on Twitter, it's gonna be really hard to reach beyond the people you can see. So you want to make sure that you're using all of those aspects uh, when you're trying to get the word out and attract clients. You can also partner with other companies. Uh, especially with Facebook, this is something we do with our clients all the time. We'll write about a place in their community uh, and then we'll tag that person and suddenly that person's audience is now a part of our client's audience. So it works for both of them because they're able to kind of merge their networks that way. So thinking through those things ahead of time helps you to be able to build your business. 
Okay, and then you track and test everything and you, you set future expectations based on those results. So if you find out that sharing to Twitter hasn't done anything for you, is that where you wanna spend your time? I don't think you'll get those results. I think you'll find that it actually builds your business. But if you find it builds your business, then you're gonna to wanna to put more effort there. You may even wanna hire somebody to help you to build that. And it's just a matter of seeing what's worked. Okay, you can do all the graphs and, um, and, and keep that as a reference point for yourself, but you can also use common sense and see where are my leads coming from. You know, look in the dashboards of your site, find out who are your top referrers. Look over your list, where did these, you know, we built these websites, who sent us those websites? And work those connections a little bit better and make, make better relationships. Send someone a gift card or a box of chocolate to say thank you if they send you some work because they're gonna appreciate the fact that you remembered them. And this leads into step 10, which is teaming with others and building relationships. Because as you build those relationships, everyone will be invested in what you're doing. Your staff, your vendors, your clients, your community will back you up and start talking about what you're doing. Your family and your friends, of course, right? They're always gonna be there for you, we hope. Uh, <laughs> but those other avenues, the community is an amazing place to go, whether it's your industry community or your local uh, geographic community. And step 11, oh, we're not there. Because we must carry as we climb in this life. I love this quote because as you're growing your business, as you're climbing and trying to reach these steps and make this all happen, you're also gonna have people along the way that you can help. And it's by helping one another that we really achieve a lot more in our lives. So step 10. We just did, okay, step 11. Um, and then once you've done this and you have your business coming in, you start to realize that you can walk away. And I've been able to take weeks off from my business now because I've set up these systems, these practices, these people who are gracious enough to allow me to be able to walk away. And um, by figuring out what it is I do all day, I'm able to help them see what they can do all day and how they can uh, grow our business without me being there. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions that aren't tied to the slides that you'd like to ask? Do you have one? Oh, no, I don't. I, okay. was, I was thinking to myself that you uh, you were talking to me, right? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking to myself, he's got it like directly at 45 minutes, and I was just impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Without my notes, you guys, that's crazy. <laughs> okay, but yes, in the back. I was just going to say one thing that you mentioned was the use of video for training like, employees and everything. Yes. Absolutely. So um, he just said that he has found that making training videos for his clients, not just the people who are working for him, helps him um, to explain things better. And the beauty of a video is if that client doesn't understand you the first time, they can watch a second or third. So especially in training your client how to use the back end of their site, it's beautiful to do a video because they might try it and say, oh, I get it, and then a month later call you and say, help, I need a new training. Well, if you've done a video, you can just send them that link again or send them the video and they have another um, way to be able to do that. The other thing is that with those videos, you can create a YouTube channel that's a training channel, and uh, if you're developing sites that are very consistent, then you can have, um, you know, when you have something that you're troubleshooting all the time, you can just make that video and then share it. And you can do it as an unlisted video so your client's information isn't on the web. 
Any other questions? Yes. something that you are doing or have you to seek help? Because I'm kind of in that position where I don't think I've grown. I mean, my business is grown. Kind of like the way you had your clients out at Scott right? But <coughs> to get to like, you know, a much higher level, I feel like I need not just the team that I have now, I need somebody to do kind of what I do because it puts a lot of stress on me. I mean, 100 emails a day, it's crazy. Exactly. Okay. I've been there. Um, so what he's, he was asking was, can he hire a project manager or basically a clone of himself to do the work so that he can start that walk away process? So I can tell you what I did. I had, um, I hired a, well, I had a series of project managers um, and uh, an operations manager and, you know, tried different things. But um, it, last November, actually, I hired someone full-time to be my virtual office manager because we're a distributed company. So um, she has done wonders for my peace of mind because she doesn't have all the answers. She's not me. But she's really good at getting back to clients. She's really good at getting back to our vendors and our staff. And she understands the overview so nobody's going to ever replace you, uh, but you can hire people to handle that broader picture so that you can be called in for the details. And I also have a project manager uh, who manages our website builds and client coordination specifically. Uh, so he knows a little more of the tech you, so he can have those conversations. Um, but she does the overview because we have so many little lines of business going on with, with the different products we offer. But yes, it's been hugely helpful and um, I was able to go to Europe twice this past summer for extended periods of time. Not, I could not have done that four years ago. Okay, my business is five years old. And um, when I, and well, yeah, it's five years old. We have way more than 100 clients, though. Um, it's just that that's what, um, that was my progression there. Um, I couldn't have done that without having those people in place. And I use a tool that allows everyone to see my email. So my life is full transparency, you guys. The people who work for me know everything about me. Um, but that has allowed me to be able to step away. So... Okay, well, thank you so much. It was good speaking with all of you, and ask me questions if you have them.